This episode of the Topcast is proudly supported by Tonebase.co. You know, there's a variety of perspectives on uh, physics still, and this is mm. that's a hard science. You know, there's still different, really combative opinions on on the sort of basic workings of the universe. Piano technique is is a much more subjective domain, although there are important objective and sort of universal human biomechanics behind it all. But this is a domain that does not feature final answers. Uh, there's not a single teacher on our platform who knows everything there is to know about piano playing because that doesn't exist. Hello, teachers. Welcome back to the Topcast, the official music teachers podcast. It's fantastic that you're able to tune in today and listen to episode number 194. And a very special welcome to my Top Music Pro teachers. Have you ever wondered what it's like taking a lesson from an absolute master teacher? What would it be like being a fly on the wall as they teach some of the most advanced pianists in the world? And what would it be like learning from teachers like Garrick Olsen, Leonard Bernstein, or even Leon Fleischer? Well, I'm delighted to say that you can now do all these things with a platform called Tonebase.co. And on today's episode, we're going to be speaking with the head of piano, who's with us to chat about all things intermediate and advanced pedagogy, and also what Tonebase offers. And the thing that I'm most excited about and have been looking forward to telling you about for weeks and weeks is that today is the official launch of our brand new partnership with Tonebase.co, which is going to give all my Top Music Pro members ongoing access to the Tonebase platform as part of their membership. This is an incredible offer because Tonebase is one of the coolest platforms I've come across recently and it has been compared to the likes of masterclass.com if any of you are familiar with that or have seen the ads in uh, particularly on Facebook. You really get immersed in incredibly high quality video and audio instruction from some of the world's most outstanding teachers. Uh, And I personally, as you'll hear in today's episode, have been learning from Garrick Olson about how I can improve my Chopin Scherzo, which is a piece I've been working on for many, many years and continue to enjoy. But to be able to learn from someone like him is just phenomenal. So we're going to talk more about that in today's episode. Now, just a reminder too that June is also sight reading month on the blog podcast and on YouTube. And so it's a great time to think about digital sheet music. We released for our members our volume two of Top Music Sheets, which is a great opportunity for use as sight reading material if you've got higher level students, but also fantastic studio licensed music for your younger students that they're going to absolutely love. And I play through it on Facebook and Instagram. You can find videos there and uh, make sure you check it out. You can grab that from the Top Music Sheets link inside Top Music Pro membership. And we're also nearing episode number 200 and I have a very, very special guest. Some of you might have heard about who I'm interviewing, but uh, if not, I'll leave it as a bit of a secret for now. But uh, in about five episodes, I'm going to be unveiling my very special guest interview and uh, we'll pull apart a whole lot of very cool things that this young man has been doing on YouTube and also on all social media platforms. Uh, He's an absolute uh, gun and it was really great to chat with him. So, more on that coming up very, very soon. My guest today is a concert pianist, music educator and producer and also head of piano at Tonebase, as I mentioned. He holds a DMA in piano performance from the Juilliard School. Welcome to the show, Ben Lordy. Great to be with you, Tim. Um, So, look, you're quite an accomplished uh, pianist in your own right. Can you tell us a little bit about your background and the study that you've done? Well, thank you for calling me accomplished, first of all. (laughs) Well, you're more accomplished than me, that's for sure. Well... I mean, these are all relative terms, but <laughs> I, uh, I certainly am not a prodigy like some of my classmates were. Um, I suppose I was more persistent than prodigious. But, you know, when I was 13 years old, I was still playing with noodle fingers and I had barely gotten past the Bach inventions. And it wasn't clear at all that I, was, <laughs> I had a future in music. I guess the only difference between me and, and any other 13-year-old kid taking piano lessons is I didn't quit the next year when I got to high school. So Mm. something else happened, which is that I developed a strange obsession for classical piano music right around the time I was, uh, you know, becoming pubescent. I suppose there was a relation there, but I started feeling the music quite deeply. I wasn't telling my friends about it, but, you know, I was listening to my dad's Rubinstein Chopin albums and, and I was even trying to play a little bit of it. And that inspired me. And so did a new teacher that I got right around the same time who pushed me to develop my technique. So I went from playing uh, some of the Bach conventions rather poorly to within three years playing Rachmaninoff's first piano concerto. 
So wow. there was a huge, huge leap happened. I mean, it didn't sound great, but I was doing it. I was, <laughs> yeah, I was, that's right. Uh, I could do it a lot better now. But, but the point is, you know, I, I did have this sort of great leap forward at a crucial time in my life. And I don't know if you know this, maybe it happened to you, but it turns out we sort of end up having careers based on decisions we made when we're 16 or 17. So I chose to pursue music in college and that sort of set the stage for, for the rest of it. It's quite good to hear that because I've just released a teen teaching course, um, teen and transfer student teaching course. And one of the things that I do mention in there is to not assume that all teenagers want to learn pop and that they're all doing it as a hobby and they're probably going to quit. I mean, it's because it's very easy to see that as a teacher because that does happen so much. As you mentioned, it's, it's so common that kids at age 13, particularly if they're just picking it up, will quit. So it's quite extraordinary and it's great to hear that you fell in love with classical music at that period of your life, uh, which is, I think that's actually quite unusual. I'm, I'm sure it's happened to other it people. I wish, it were, I wish it were less unusual. I, yeah, as someone who also course. has taught teenagers and usually the way to get to keep them interested is to really, I mean, and this is a good thing too, is to expand the, the sort of genres that, that I'm teaching them. Although I'm not, I'm not quite as skilled as, as you and some of your colleagues at Top Music at that. So they would come, they would bring a pop song to a lesson when I'm sitting there trying to teach them a uh, Chopin prelude or something. And I had to balance it, but that was good experience too. So um, yeah. yeah, it's, I think I'm unusual, but I'm fascinated by the idea that Maybe I don't have to be. Maybe there are ways to uh, pique the curiosity of, of teenagers mm. and get them interested in classical music as well as the music that they, they love as well. And so you started learning at what age? Uh, just sort of the usual five years old, you know, okay. start them in piano lessons. But again, I don't have these videos of me at seven years old playing uh, the Goldberg variations like some kids do. I mean, it was just very normal sort of progress. I was pretty good in my teacher studio, but it was a t- typical suburban studio. Um, teacher wasn't really pushing me. Uh, I had a string of teachers and it was fun. I liked it. I didn't like to practice. Who, mm-hmm. who does mm. at that age? That's, that's very unusual. I mean, there I'm like everybody else, I suppose. Mm. But uh, so I just, again, I just kept at it. My dad, whenever I complained about practicing, my dad said, well, you have your piano teacher's number. You can just call her whenever you want and quit. And of course, that shut me up and I <laughs> got back to the instrument. But again, it was this sort of unexpected uh, revelation that I have at right around 13 that, that changed things. Must have been quite an extraordinary teacher who took you through those three years from 13, 14, 15-ish and your love of classical music. Who was he or she and what was it about him or her that uh, really captured your attention? I'm glad you asked. His name is Eric Hicks. I, I called him Dr. Hicks. He's got a, a Doctor of Musical Arts from University of Texas at Austin. He uh, had a wonderful career as a pianist and a teacher. And he had moved back to Austin where he had uh, grown up right around the time I was having this sort of turn, right in 1999, 2000. And he set up shop and ended up establishing one of the most important piano studios in, in the uh, greater Austin area for, I mean, still going, you know, going on two decades now. I was his first student that he sort of helped transform. and. Uh, yeah, I, I was developing interests on my own and listening to music, but it, really it would not have blossomed without his guidance. I would ask him about what recordings I should listen to, this or that piece. He, he introduced me to all kinds of new repertoire. And most importantly, he saw my potential and he, he showed me how to take music seriously uh, in a way that I had, didn't know was possible. While at the same time, it was part of this developing passion. You know, It wasn't grueling. It wasn't like somebody was slapping my wrist or, or forcing me to do any of this. He, he found a way to really organically um, pique my, my interests and, and allow me to develop a sort of self-motivated pursuit, which I really thank him for. Just uh, reinforces the power of a mentor and the power we all have as teachers to really impact t- students' lives. Uh, it sounds like a great connection. And I remember similarly with my first teacher, just, just the way she was able to inspire me was, was phenomenal and has set me up for what, what I'm doing today as well. Yeah, and I still keep in touch with him. You know, he's still, he's still friends with me all these all Very these cool. Later, yeah. So, yeah. so are you teaching at the moment? Not right now, at least not directly. I, I think mm. indirectly my job has plenty of... Uh, pedagogical elements. But I don't know if you know this about startups, but you don't have a lot of spare time <laughs> to do anything else. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that I like my job at Tonebase. But uh, 
you know, I, I squeeze in some practice at the end of the day and I'm keeping up with performing, but it would be irresponsible of me to try to have students right now because I wouldn't be able to dedicate the proper attention to them. But mm. I did spend a decade in, in New York uh, and I had a studio that reached about a dozen or 15 students of all ages. And, you know, that was a big learning experience for me too. And uh, I wouldn't be able to do my job now if it weren't for those sort of formative teaching experiences. So we mentioned in the introduction uh, that you work at Tonebase, a company that I'm really excited to be partnering with and uh, that when, when you burst onto the scene for piano at the end of 2019, uh, you did lots of advertising on Facebook and that's how I found out about you. I thought, oh, this is a, a company that I'm interested in. So tell us what is Tonebase all about and uh, what's the goal of the site? The goal of Tonebase is to make high-level classical music education accessible and affordable to music lovers all over the world. Uh, sort of a simple concept, but no one's really done it yet. No one maybe had the resources. I say classical music now, but eventually we have aspirations for other genres, maybe even non-musical skills and activities. But you have to start somewhere. And uh, we have three wonderful founders who met at, at Yale University. Two of them were classical guitar grad students. And uh, they sort of spawned this idea at the time there. And we, they, they created a company that was dedicated to teaching classical guitar and this sort of pilot platform. And they got a bunch of, you know, their mentors to hook them up with, with great classical guitarists. They got a, they won a bunch of videos filmed on iPhones at the time. And they really were persistent. And they made a lot of great and shrewd decisions and ended up also a little bit of luck was involved. And they found their way to Silicon Valley. And, you know, a year later, they were raising the funds to expand to piano. And, and that's when uh, sort of I've, gotten, I've gotten involved since then. So. Mm. And so how did they connect with you? And, and what do you do there? Yeah, so I, it's funny, one of their, when they were at Yale, they sort of came up with the germ of the idea for tone bass in the music and business class that they took. And it turns out the teacher of that music and business class is, is an adult. Of course, she's an adult, but she's a woman who I taught one piano lesson to in Manhattan. She was one of my adult <laughs> students. And uh, this is why you should never say no to a gig because <laughs> actually it was a pal of mine. I was subbing for him. And her name is Astrid Baumgartner, wonderful woman, philanthropist and amateur, great amateur pianist. She was, I think she was playing the, Sh the Chopin Polonaise Fantasy, which I wouldn't even touch. And we had a great lesson. I didn't think anything of it, but two years later, she ended up writing me a strong recommendation to her former students who were running this company now. And I mm. think that was obviously a big factor in it. And also, I just, I, a lot of the things I was interested in and a lot of the experience I had, I, I think, set me up for a job uh, I had been doing a lot in, in sort of concert curation, concert organizing. I'd, I had been a teacher for a while in all kinds of domains. I had this obsessive history with the classical piano repertoire and, and I was pretty well connected with pianists. So um, I think that's what they saw in me and, and they said, okay, this is our guy. Mm. And so your main role is to curate the piano content, find the master teachers, organize the video recording of them and, and ask and, and in many videos you're actually on screen interviewing them effectively at the piano is that the role the role started as a sort of artist relations manager for classical piano and with the sort of added job of building the piano platform it wasn't clear to me at first how that would unfold and so it was very artist driven at first i need to find artists i need to accumulate content so it's the the role has evolved from First, just writing a million emails, making phone calls, tapping into my connections, trying to get great professors and concert pianists interested. And then it moved to setting up productions, learning about that whole world, which was mm. new to me. And um, then flying around the country and directing these things, interviewing people in them, helping them lesson plan ahead of time. And then, and this is the thing I was totally not ready for, post-production, which ends up being the most time-consuming, most tedious process, uh, in some cases, fun and creative, but mostly just extremely taxing and time consuming. So I didn't really budget time for that because I didn't realize I was <laughs> going to end up having such a role in that. So I've been wearing many hats, as is the nature in a, an early startup for, for first employees, but we're expanding, we're growing. I've got a great team behind me now. And, uh, you know, I guess the sky's the limit. I think the thing I loved most about the tone based concept, uh, well, there was two things. It reminded me very strongly of masterclass.com. I don't know if that's a fair comparison, but uh, one of the things I know about masterclass uh, and anyone who's been on Facebook in the last two years would have seen masterclass ads coming up 
all the time, uh, featuring you know the amazing chefs teaching cooking and the film direct. I mean, it's just about Steven Spielberg teaching film directing and stuff like that. Like it's amazing who they get. They get amazing people, and they the quality of their videos is extraordinary. And I, I you know, I particularly liked um, seeing Hans Zimmer. Like, like it just made me go, you know, how on earth did these people get? <laughs> these incredible people to join their platform. <laughs> and as soon as I saw Tone Base, I thought, oh my, these guys are doing exactly the same thing for the music teaching world, which was one thing that really drew me to it. The second was how much I learned when I was starting to really get into piano teaching from watching masterclasses. Seeing these master teachers teaching other students was mind-blowing. It was kind of frustrating because I thought I'm never going to be able to play as well as these guys do. I used to to get completely awestruck by the fact that these master teachers could play anything without the music uh, mm-hmm. from any <laughs> any bit of repertoire. It was, I, was, I didn't understand how that worked. But it gave me such motivation. It taught me so much about teaching as well just to see how they were working with their students. I thought, you know, even though I wasn't teaching at that level, I absorbed a lot and was able to pass that on to my students. So with tone base, are most of the videos recorded like that masterclass style or is it more the teachers are directly teaching to the video? As of recently, it's both, but primarily we have adopted the what you call the masterclass.com style. Right. And while we will continue to explore other formats, those will likely continue to be special features for the time being and Right now, most of our videos are teachers teaching to the camera, to you, so it feels personalized, which is both you know, a positive and also it brings challenges because a lot of our teachers are used to teaching an actual student in front of mm-hmm. them. So to sort of find a way to conceptualize things in a more abstract way away from the student is, is a challenge for them, actually. And it, it's also interesting, I think, many of them embrace the challenge and, and really thrive. Others said to me, I mean, can I just teach a student? And I've I caved and I set out for <laughs> fine. Let's let's just see how that goes. So if you go onto the site now, you can find really fascinating masterclasses with uh, Leon Fleischer, one of the great American pianists of the 20th century, teaching me. Although he wasn't originally supposed to teach me, I'm not just trying to get myself in there. Uh, I was filling in for a student who had to cancel, and another student of his, Rachel Kudo, who's a phenomenal pan- pianist in her own right. And we found that this format is also intoxicating. I mean, we have mm. to do more of these too, because especially the way we film it, um, it really feels like you're a fly on the wall or you're four different flies on the, on different walls and you, you get right up next to the hands and they're behaving like there's no cameras in the room. So it's it's not like on YouTube, you find some master classes with bad audio and a camera in the back of the hall and, and you can barely hear anything. Like this is really still for the viewer. Mm. But again, most of our classes um, are like master class. If I could comment on the masterclass comparison, totally fair. Uh, <laughs> it was it was definitely an influence on our founders when they were developing their initial concept. Now, if you think about it, it's actually sort of the inverse or the opposite of tone base in a certain way, because what masterclass does is they get a whole bunch of celebrities to each teach their particular skill in depth for three or four hours, however long it is, and that's it. It's one celebrity teaching their skill. Now they might get several chefs teaching different things, several writers teaching different things, but they're not necessarily all sort of comprehensively fitting together. We take one skill at a time and we get a bunch of teachers, maybe not celebrities, relatively, Hmm. some of them are celebrities. Some of them are celebs in the piano teaching world. We're hoping to get bigger ones too, of course. They tend to come with a bigger price tag. But um, (laughs) but, uh, we get lots of just great teachers professors from top music schools, winners of competitions, who, who actually some of the younger teachers on the platform are, are some of the best. Nico Namaradzi, who just won the Honins competition mm, in she's Canada. Awesome. He's fantastic. And um, if, you, if you watch his videos, you think, is this guy, has this guy lived a full life? You know, and his wisdom is sort of unmatched in a way. So uh, teachers can be all ages. But right, so comparing it to Masterclass, what Tonebase is able to do in a single vertical, as we call it, or a single domain or skill is dive into that skill and sort of uh, deconstruct it and break it apart and, into a thousand different ways and, and have teachers on every node of that uh, teaching that particular skill. So your experience inside the platform is one of just immersion in a whole slew of interconnected ideas, which are all really intermediate to advanced 
uh, ideas in my domain, classical piano. We also have a classical guitar platform and we're looking to expand to, to other instruments soon. So in that way, it's, it's sort of the opposite of a uh, master class. Also, we don't have, we didn't just get a hundred million dollars <laughs> from, from investors. So they, they sort of have, they have some more connections, but you know, we're working on it. This episode is presented in collaboration with our friends at Tonebase. Tonebase is an online music education platform dedicated to making the highest level instruction affordable to students, teachers, and amateurs around the world. The Tonebase piano artist roster features world-class concert pianists and recording artists like Garrick Olsen and Simona Dinerstein. Legendary musicians like Leon Fleischer, gold medalists of Chopin, Clyburn and Queen Elizabeth International competitions, as well as professors from top conservatories like Juilliard, Curtis, Eastman, Yale and Peabody. In a library of over 150 high-quality in-depth videos, these artists share their insights with you on the craft of piano playing in all its breadth, including tutorials on intermediate and advanced repertoire, workshops on technique and musicianship, as well as interviews and special features. As a privilege of joining Top Music Pro, members receive free, unlimited access to the Tonebase piano platform. Join Top Music Pro to experience the incredible resources Tonebase has to offer at topmusicpro.com. And for more information on Tonebase, visit tonebase.co slash piano. That's tonebase.co slash piano for more information. One of the things that I've really enjoyed is finding masterclasses or videos on tone base on pieces that I'm trying to play myself. And so the Scherzo with Garrick Olsen, I found uh, fantastic. Mm. And the Chopin Ballades, they, I mean, there's lots of pieces that are on there already. What would you say to teachers who um, perhaps aren't playing at that level or don't have students at that level? Can they still learn even if the repertoire being presented isn't sort of stuff that they're teaching? Absolutely. I Well, first of all, I don't know if you're aware, but the piano repertoire is infinite vast from the yeah. last time i checked it doesn't end <laughs> it's like the galaxy it is like the universe yep now not all of those stars in the universe are as shining as brightly as others but it's a big repertoire and we'll never get to the end of it so there's always going to be somebody playing a piece or teaching a piece that you know they're not going to find on the platform also it just it takes time to make these so instead while you there are many popular pieces of of all levels, really from early intermediate through the hardest pieces you can imagine. Um, and many of them, the ones that people play most often, there's still going to be pieces that you, you're not going to find that, that you might be interested in. However, I find that the way to use the platform is to actually sort of take lessons, maybe on a piece that you're not playing or by a composer who you are playing, but on a different piece by the same composer or one of our skills videos. And once you watch a few of them, you start sort of absorbing some of the more universal concepts um, that these higher level teachers have at their disposal. And I find this almost more helpful than having somebody just say, okay, you know, in this piece that you're playing, do this, do that. Because maybe that helps you learn that piece. But what sort of immersing yourself in tone base can do is just raise your general musicianship level to new heights. And what what I, what you end up finding, and this also parallels my experience having developed in the conservatory world and studied at Juilliard and and studied with many different teachers and figured things out with with friends and just immersed myself um, around pianists uh, and with great musicians of, of other instruments too and listened to lots of recordings. That's how I learned. You yeah. know, it wasn't because I took one lesson or or learned from this one great teacher on this one piece. I can only approach new pieces now because of that sort of cumulative element. And so while eventually we will have just about all of the standard rep represented, and that can certainly be helpful if you want very particular advice on a given passage, it turns out piano technique and musicianship, it doesn't matter what you're playing. It's, it sort of comes back to the same sort of common elements. And, and that, that's the kind of wisdom I think you can gain on tone base. I think that really hits the nail on the head because as I was developing my own skills as a teacher, uh, I also read lots of books, went to lots of lectures, masterclasses, learned from various teachers, learned as much as I could, watched as many YouTubes as I could. And I think the thing that that does is also give you, gives you confidence as a teacher to know that what you're doing is is right, to be able to take all the evidence that you've got and go this is my approach and I'm happy with this because I've seen X, Y, and Z and they all do this. And so this is what I'm doing. Because I find a lot of teachers can be quite unsure of themselves, particularly when it comes to things like technique, because there are so many different approaches out there and it's very easy to second guess ourselves. 
So I think one of the things that something like Tonebase can help with and watching masters in action can help with is helping people realize that there are many different ways of approaching all these technical challenges and there are many different ways to teach and that's okay. You've got to take what you like and what you see out there and make it your own and that's your approach and you can then feel more confident with it. And I think that that's a really important result of something Absolutely. like this. Yeah. Not only is it okay, I think it's it's vital that there's a variety of perspectives. You know, there's a variety of perspectives on uh, physics still. And this is, mm. that's a hard science. You know, there's still different, really combative opinions on on the sort of basic workings of the universe. Piano technique is, is a much more subjective domain, although there are important objective and sort of universal human biomechanics behind it all. But this is a domain that does not feature final answers. Uh, there's not a single teacher on our platform who knows everything there is to know about piano playing because that doesn't exist. Mm. Uh, so that can be liberating. That can, I, I think, bring to a teacher who may have been worried that they, you just didn't know that, that secret that these, some of these conservatory professors or these uh, concert pianists might have known. They'll certainly learn some of those secrets, but what they'll also learn is that their way of teaching had a lot of validity to it. Mm, and they'll see right. that some idea they had was is validated in something Gary Colson has said. Mm. And he loves to talk about the piano as a box of decrescendos. <laughs> uh, and actually other, other teachers have made this point too. And you think about it for a second and it's obvious, but it's a deep point. When you strike the key of, a, of an acoustic piano and an and a electric piano that's imitating one, it immediately starts decaying. There's no growth to the sound. We can only simulate crescendi and growth like through illusion on, on the piano. And, and that's a big part of teaching at a high level. And I think it's a big part of teaching at more intermediate and elementary levels too, because this sort of illusion uh, making is one of the, the coolest parts of playing the piano. And I think it's also something that could, could hook coming back to teaching kids could really hook a kid is to say, Hey, can you make this sound like something that isn't actually going on? You know, can you be a magician at the piano and create new effects, create new colors? And uh, yeah, bringing it back to tone base, it, this is a place where you can go and see that some of the greatest pianists and the greatest teachers in the world are agreeing and disagreeing mm. about some fundamental aspects of piano playing. I, one of the examples I like to give is, is hand position. You know, this is something where it's supposed to be basic, right? You, you just look it up in the manual, the user manual, and it's, <laughs> okay, put the ball in your hand and, you know, whatever it is. I've got on tape Leon Fleischer advocating a more flat-fingered approach and talking about the advantages there. He talks about the, the keys as being extensions of the finger. Now, you might say, wait, flat fingers, that's bad, right? Because that means no support. That means no maybe noodles. Look at his hand. I mean, you have to develop it, but you can see an incredible amount of support in the fingers. And what happens when you have a, a longer finger is you can control your tone in a way that's less direct, uh, less abrasive, right? And you can get a bell-like sound and a real golden tone this way. So, you know, if a, if a teacher who's used to teaching six or seven year olds heard this, they might say blasphemy. <laughs> but if they hear it from Leon Fleischer, they might say, oh, okay, maybe he's, <laughs> maybe he's onto something here. <laughs> On the other hand, we have Boris Berman from Yale professor advocating round, rounder fingers as the norm and saying we get a little flatter and you play on the pads when you want certain kinds of tones. And so it's, is there disagreement there or is there overlap? It's a difference in perspective in intent and aesthetics. And neither of them are right, although they would disagree with me on that. And the, the pleasure of it, and I think the, the, the fascination for me of this is that they're helping us really explore this mystery and, and sort of probe it and get to the bottom of this, this really like sort of never ending pursuit to, to develop our techniques in this way and, and to really express ourselves at the instrument. I can hear piano teachers across the world screaming because they just want to be told what is the right way to do things and i'm asked all the time what is the right approach for technique there, there, there must be one correct way as to shaping phrases hand position use of the elbow all this kind of stuff the answer is and it's just been confirmed by ben is there is no one way and we all need to realize that it's part of our role as professional teachers to come up with our approach that we're happy with based on the evidence that we've seen around us, based on what we've 
experience with our students and that's okay. And that's, <laughs> I think that's, I, I agree. I, I would say there are, there are wrong ways. I mean, there well, are, sure, there are sure, yeah. to, but, <laughs> but just because there aren't, you know, there isn't one the right way doesn't mean like there, there aren't certain kinds of approaches that could have negative effects on kids. However, I think what you're saying is, is really important. Um, and I, I don't think it's all subjective. I don't think it's all just, okay, figure it out for yourself and then you can do it. If that were true, then everybody would be playing Chopin etudes because they would have figured it out based mm. on their own technique. There has to be some kind of objective uh, reference point, something that we can all come back to. And that's also present on the site. You do see a lot of commonality and a lot of points. Turns out we all have basically the same kinds of bodies when you get down to the, the sort of mechanics of it all. On the surface, we look very different. But at the end of the day, we're subject to the laws of physics, the same laws of physics, as far as I know. I, maybe in Australia, there's, there's different laws of physics down there. But as far as I'm aware, they're universal. And our bodies have a certain shape and a certain set of le levers and joints to them. And we, all, we more or less all share that. And so a lot of that kind of mechanical teaching, which can be dry and can be, you know, if you overemphasize that, it can lead in negative directions. But it's important to to focus on that, and a lot of our teachers do, and sort of giving this physical foundation to all of the emotional, expressive kinds of effects you want to make. It's just that you realize when you keep pursuing it, that's where the variety emerges. But mm. I do think there's a common, a sort of common source of knowledge as well, a sort of fountain that that everyone's drinking from. And that's the other aspect of the site that's great too. It's both it shows the variety of perspectives and it also shows these commonalities. And I think that's also important for teachers to realize is, is you can find both of these things on the site and, and they're both important. You've worked with some absolute stalwarts of the industry. We've name dropped a few and I'll, I'll give you permission to name drop a few more if you'd like. Uh, and you must have a couple of stories from these characters as well. Can you share some stories? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you mentioned Garrick Olson who I'm sure he flies down to Australia time to time and plays concertos and recitals. And he's, he's somebody who has a, who does have a galaxy for a brain. And, and I think he knows <laughs> something like 70 or 80 concertos by memory. Give him a couple of days. He'll pull out rock three or, or the Busoni concerto, which is an, a nightmare of a piece, but so he's phenomenal. And he could just talk your ear off in the best way. I just said, I pressed go on him and he just taught Chopin Ballade or Chopin Scherzo for an hour and a half. And it was so structured too. I, I was really surprised crazy. he was capable of doing this. Other teachers do more lesson planning because they have to. He's able to spontaneously deliver one of these lessons um, almost from scratch. But probably my favorite experience of late was working with uh, three nonagenarians, 90 plus year old gentlemen, all born in the 1920s. So they've made it to the 20s in the following century. I hope I can say that about myself and when I get to the 2080s. And they're still playing, they're still teaching. It's, it's so inspiring. Um, I'm speaking of Seymour Bernstein, who recently became sort of international celebrity because the actor Ethan Hawke made a documentary about him, which all of your listeners should, should watch if they haven't already, because he met Ethan Hawke at a dinner party and inspired him after a couple of comments to, to make this like documentary about him. Wow. So clearly, he's got some magic to him. And just being around Seymour Bernstein, there's a twinkle in his eye. There's a part of him which will infinitely be young and filled with wonder, but at the same time, filled with wisdom of 93 years of teaching and playing the piano. He's written important books, actually, on, on beginner and intermediate a technique. Um, he calls it, I think it's 20 lessons in keyboard choreography. That's something your listener should absolutely look up. He's got videos back from the 80s or 90s that correspond with them. And for us, he made a lot of wonderful intermediate content for Elise uh, Schumann's album for the young, uh, Chopin E minor prelude, and, and some other wonderful lessons where what he does best is combine the physical with the expressive. So he shows how every expressive intention that you have must be grounded in some kind of action movement, and movement right. that that is that is natural, right? And so the the question is, okay, well, what is, what are the natural motions and how do we develop them? And the way he teaches this is just so inspiring. He's both he both knows when to say like this is the law, this is what you must do, but also show you what all the possibilities are at the same time. Getting back to what I was saying before, you know, he's able to combine this sort of objective truths and also the, the sort of sub subjective exploration. 
So he was wonderful. And then I, the next week I, I got to work with these two guys. They were part of a team of young pianists. They were young in the 30s and 40s. I sort of nicknamed the O-Yaps, the Outstanding Young American Pianists. That's Gary Grafman, Leon Fleischer, and there were some, some other pianists who have, who have since passed. Van Cliburn was, was among them. And Gary Grafman uh, is an absolute hoot. Uh, he took me to his mini bar. We did a whole session in there. He basically <laughs> invented, he invented the practice of creating flavored vodkas of, of all different types. I mean, it, it had been done before, but he took it to new levels with horseradish and dill and ginger. And he was making me all these things. And we just got to talking about, you know, a lot of the great musicians and, and the pianists of the 20th century who he, he had encountered. And he told some great stories about um, actually recording Gershwin's Rhapsody in, in Blue for uh, Woody Allen's Manhattan. So if anyone's seen that film, oh, uh, wow. you know, you get the soundtrack, it's Gary Graffin playing, but he's got a whole crazy story about how that came together. And then, of course, Leon Fleischer, who was one of my big heroes as a teenager back when I was obsessing, as I mentioned, over piano repertoire i mean i fell in love with the beethoven fourth concerto and his and his um recording of that was just in my cd player in my car at all times uh and i had a lot of driving to do because high school was far away so i listened to it a million times and i got the wonderful privilege of playing the opening phrase for him and you can see a lesson on that on toe bass as well so those are those are three of my favorites of of recently and are you able to give a sneak peek uh Top secret, uh, who might be coming up or who you would like, perhaps? Maybe the second, because, you know, I, if I did know, I would be keeping a secret if, right, it were, okay. <laughs> if it were a big name. But actually, partially because this most recent round of productions just ended with, with the gentleman I just discussed. Uh, and then, of course, COVID has happened. Productions have been somewhat stalled. And it's okay. Mm. We have a huge backlog of content that we're still rolling out. So I'm in the process of recruiting um, and developing curricula and, and lesson plans and reaching out to teachers. But there's certainly a wish list. And I've gotten pretty close to certain artists talking to their managers or friends of theirs. And so I'm sort of, I'm waiting in the wings with, with some, some important people. But some that I would love to work with are, um, Marc-Andre Hamlin is considered oh, one of the yes. greatest pianists in the world and his technique is from outer space. And I, I hope he has enough time in his schedule and is interested in tone bass because he's filled with all kinds of crazy, interesting ideas about mm. how to redivide the keyboard and just really unorthodox ways of practicing and approaching the piano that I trust him on because you just got to listen to him play. But also, I mean, I would love to work with Yu Jo Wong. Oh, <laughs> of mean, course. Yeah. I don't know if she would, but, um, you know, a lot of these great pianists and celebrity superstar types are not teaching because they're on tour all the time. And so mm. getting in front of the camera and, and sort of sharing pedagogical knowledge uh, with users is not something they're necessarily going to quickly find themselves being comfortable with. So I have to think of alternative ideas uh, if, if we do get to, to be rewarded with these kinds of folks. But if you want my, to know my real, I mean, the big wish list would, would include people I think might be sort of un, untouchable and that's that's martha argerich if she would uh, ever yeah, just yeah you know teach your tone base I, I would love it martha if you're listening to the podcast <laughs> yeah martha <laughs> right she's she, she just taught music insider i'm sure <laughs> but uh no she doesn't teach this is the thing i mean some of these mm. great luminaries don't teach and that's that actually brings up another point which is uh this divide between the teacher and the performer i mean it it sort of exists of course a lot of them do both but some of the greatest teachers had to, on some level, set aside their performance aspirations because they had such passion for teaching and, and they were great at it. Seymour Bernstein being one of them, his whole documentary, Seymour, an introduction that Ethan Hawke produced, is about how he left the stage to focus on teaching. Uh, so there is this kind of, you know, either or aspect to it. Garrick Olson's a rare breed who can <laughs> have a, you know, 80 concerts or 100 concerts a year, or maybe 200, who knows how many he's giving, and still be a great teacher. But it's it's often that you don't see, you don't really see that, because some of the best don't know why they're good. <laughs> yeah, and no, it's true. But the be yeah. the best performers, the best physicists, the best anybody in the top of their field mm. aren't necessarily the best teachers. That will always be That's right. Yeah. Well, this is teaching itself is a skill. Mm, it's, exactly. And it's not that whatever it is that you're teaching is a different skill. And mm. so you have to acquire this other skill. 
which isn't just going to be naturally present just because you learned how to do something really well or had the talent for it. And I do think on some level, I can criticize masterclass.com, which otherwise I respect enormously. There's an infotainment aspect to it, which sort of sells you the idea that these celebrities, because they're great, also know why they're great and can share it with you. Now, I think from what I can tell is behind the scenes, they're trying to make it seem that way as much as possible. But a lot of these people don't naturally have the instincts to teach. So uh, they do a really good job with it, making these celebrities seem like they're also great pedagogues. But I I bet it takes a lot of work behind Mm -hmm. the scenes to really structure that kind of that kind of thing, because just because you can shoot a three pointer doesn't mean you can teach me how to shoot a three pointer. Right. Although I, I used to play basketball, I, I'm decent at it. But, uh, <laughs> I would love for Steph Curry to improve me on that. I think one of the other things that we haven't mentioned about Tone Base as well is that once you're in there, it's not that you're, it's not like Netflix where you just watch something and then you click on and watch the next thing. The screen is structured in such a way that you have bookmarks, you can see the score and the score moves along as the teacher is working on the score. I think that is phenomenal. I don't know how you guys have done that tech, but it's very cool. You can also see it jump to different sections. uh, And I think, Ben, you're probably part of determining what the most important sections are and labeling those. So it's not just a matter of watching a video. You're actually guided along as well. And I think that's a really clever aspect we should have mentioned before, probably. In a way, we're visualizing the lesson plan uh, Mm -hmm. so that you're not just watching the video. And this is part of the deal, right? This is what separates us from YouTube on some level. You can only do so much with YouTube's technologies. But yeah, we have the score sync for sure. And you can also resize the score. You you can also get rid of the score if you just want to watch the video. So there's a lot of customization involved and you you can jump around to different parts. So we have this sort of lesson plan organized on the side. You can download one of our custom PDF scores because luckily most of what what our teachers are teaching is in the public domain. And we were able Mm -hmm. to actually create our own very cool additions that leave a lot of space for notations. For a lot of the intermediate rep, we have annotated scores, which give you an analysis, and it, it sort of has the teacher's markings from the lesson. And we have a very cool feature called Spotlight. So if you're watching and the teachers who inevitably are very erudite and have lots of you know, name dropping to do, say something about a, an 18th century you know, poet or whatever, uh, it'll drop down a little, a little bubble and you can click on a link and um, it'll more. tell you all about that particular reference. So. We have these ed- educational features built in and we're always developing them and we're innovating new ones all the time. So this is where really like education is the point of this. It's not just about watching fun videos, although you can do that too. <laughs> True. Well, look, I'm delighted, uh, Ben, to announce that today is the formal launch of the agreement that we've got between Top Music and Tone Bass. I'm delighted to be working with you and your team um, to be able to offer, drum roll, every Top Music Pro Studio and Evolution member full access to Tone Base as of today moving forward. Um, and all our members listening, you can jump in right now and find out all the details in our discount section of our academy to find out more about that. Um, and I think the great thing I'm really loving about this partnership in particular, Ben, is that most of my work to date is on contemporary music, pop, improvising, composing, and a lot about beginners and teenagers uh, and also the business side of teaching, which complements beautifully what you're doing at the moment, which is really coming almost down from the top. You've started with incredibly high-level, difficult repertoire, advanced repertoire, advanced students and things like that. Um, And now you're moving down to um, provide some of the intermediate repertoire as well. So I I think it strikes a great balance. Um, And you've actually, you're inside our membership. You've been in there and had a bit of a look around. Do you think that that complementary factor is going to work well for um, this partnership? Absolutely. It's as if we're sort of meeting in the middle and, and we didn't even intend to. But uh, maybe we should consider a merger, Tim. No, but uh, no, I think it's they're two very complementary sites, as you said. One sort of starts from the roots, and the other sort of comes down from the sky. Uh, but for any of your users, and I, I absolutely love the, the forums and the interface inside, and the workshops and the academy. Uh, I've just started to get a taste of them, but I'm definitely just out of my own curiosity and and uh, edification. I'm going to be back there for sure. And what I see there is some of the most <laughs> noble teachers around the world doing the hard work that right. frankly a lot of the you know a lot of the sort of older esteemed professors are relying on so you don't get to be a Yale professor Juilliard professor Curtis Eastman wherever Sydney conservatory if, I'm not sure mm-hmm. which way, 
Now, you don't get yeah. to get to that yeah. level. Who you don't get to teach talented students unless they had a great teacher uh, when they were younger. And so there is just you know, and often un, the unsung heroes of of great mus- musicians who really stands behind them are the teachers who are doing the hard work. And and your platform really represents that, and I really appreciate that about it. So I hope that we don't get too much of the glory because really we owe it to teachers like like those who who participate in your community. Absolutely. Now, in terms of the genre cross thing, we are just a classical pr- uh, platform at the moment. We hope to develop high level jazz uh, courses by the end of the year. So I don't think it's, it's too far off. But there has been this split between classical training and um, other genres, more popular genres, style training for a while now. I don't think it's a good thing, frankly. I think that there are ways in which both sides should learn, can learn from each other and learn a lot from each other. One of my best friends, Peter Dugan, who's, who's the new host of uh, From the Top, if you know that program uh, in America, he is an outstanding jazz pianist and classical pianist at the same time. And you can see it. You can hear it when he plays a Beethoven sonata that he has a c- certain technical aspects to his technique, which allow for him to sort of find a groove in Beethoven, right? And I think vice versa, it can work. So if you're developing your chops uh, in, in more popular genres, um, there are limitations to a lot of the sort of schools of training uh, that the classical field can sort of answer. Uh, and I think that they can really inform one another. So tone base takes you from a kind of intermediate classical level and, and, and sort of takes you higher and higher from there. And you can basically, I think your users can, can enrich themselves with uh, all the resources that you provide and then see tone base as this kind of like, okay, well, let's let's see if I can take this to a next level in this classical track. And mm. even if you're not that interested in, you know, learning Beethoven or Chopin, which I mean, you should at least try it. This music is phenomenal. You can learn so much again from immersing yourself in domains and and genres that you're less familiar with. Learning from musicians who are in these parallel fields who do something very similar to what you do at a high level, but it might have something to teach you. I know if if I were on the other side, like I would. I would love to just hang out with a bunch of jazz cats for a year and learn everything I could about it, improvising um, and, and developing a groove and, and an internal sense of rhythm and all the things that that they bring to the table that I wish you know was on the classical end of pedagogy as well. So there's this split, but I do think like creating partnerships like this can also help sort of. Uh, build bridge, a bridge divides, yeah. between those yeah one of the things that i got most value out of as well as watching these other people uh and master classes was having my own lessons as a student and as a teacher again but being a student to a more amazing teacher and learning harder repertoire and challenging myself to do that and i think that's a- another reason that i really enjoy spending time in tone base because it can continue to push me along with for example uh, chopin skirt third scherzo and a couple of his other ones that I've been trying that are all nightmares. They're all really hard, but I absolutely adore the music. Uh, and so I'm really, I use this as a chance and I prioritize this in my own schedule time for me to work on my own skills as a pianist. And I think for all teachers out there, I know we all work incredibly hard, particularly in the current circumstances. Not many of us have much time, but if you can possibly find that time to work on your own skills, perhaps have some lessons, but at least keep moving forward with your own practice. I think that is so important. And something like tone base can really inspire you to do more of that. I, th- I think that's one of the big benefits. Yeah, I, I agree with that a lot for sure. That's a great sentiment. And uh, I, I would add that I, I can relate to that a lot because when I was finishing my doctorate at Juilliard and, and teaching on the side, I really felt like I was not a performer anymore. Um, and I actually had to consciously step away uh, from from some of the activities I was focusing on that were more academic in nature to say, no, I'm a pianist. Damn it, I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna do this. Uh, this is what I pursued, and I'm not just going to teach and write and whatever else it was. And I found a way to do both. And and now at Tone Base, I can be both again, sort of behind the scenes as a teacher. I can do pedagogy and I can can do performance at the same time. And I think it's important because. I wouldn't be the musician I am if it weren't for my teaching. I mean, I learned, I probably learned the most. Yes, I learned a lot from my teachers, but I learned even more almost from trying to teach myself and going through this process of deconstructing things and working backwards. How do I teach the student? Well, what are the principles? You know, where are they at? And then I have to reflect on my own technique. I have to see where I am. 
I have to ask questions that improve my musicianship. So it's, it's really important that I think teachers stay active uh, in developing their own musicianship skills. Again, we're never done learning. And I think that's what all the users at Tonebase have in common, whether they're amateur, professional, student, or teacher. They're, they're all just committed to learning for the rest of their lives. Ben, it's been just awesome to chat with you today. So for more information about Tonebase itself, go to Tonebase, T-O-N-E-B-A-S-E dot co, C-O. And for all of my Top Music Pro members, or if you're interested in a Top Music Pro membership, head to topmusicpro.com and grab one of either our studio or evolution memberships and you can uh, join us with uh, Tonebase access as well. It's so great to have you here, Ben. Thanks again. Thanks for being inside the membership as well. And I'm sure people can connect with you there and ask questions as well. Until uh, next time we see you, thanks again. Really appreciate your time today. Awesome. Thanks, Tim. I had a great time. Well, I hope you're as inspired as I am to unpack and explore Tonebase.co. If you're not currently a Top Music Pro member, then this is one of the best opportunities to come in, jump on, and get your access to Tonebase. You can join us on any of our studio or evolution plans. Uh, this isn't available as part of our light plan, but on our studio or uh, evolution plans. And all our current members who are on those tiers will have access to this right now. So all you need to do is head to our discount section and you be able to find out the details of how to connect over to the tone based platform very very cool now next week on the podcast uh, we unpack one of the trickiest things which have affected teachers during the lockdown uh, and that's particularly if you're a group teacher or someone who does a lot of group work and that's student motivation and continuing to build community in your studio while everyone is so remote and apart from each other so next week on the show i'm talking with the hilarious beth horton about how the tanara app is solving a lot of these issues for students and teachers around the world. And if you haven't met Beth yet, she's an absolute hoot and I know you're going to really enjoy our chat. Whether or not you're using Tanara uh, at all, you'll get lots out of this one. So I'm Tim Topham and you've been listening to the Topcast from topmusic.co. I enjoy looking forward. I look forward to chatting with you again soon. For more information about this episode and to find out how to enhance your own teaching, visit topmusic.co. You'll find everything you need for your studio from lesson plans to cheat sheets, quick win teaching ideas and guides on how to build your teaching business. Plus, you'll be connected to a global community of the world's top music teachers. And when you're ready, join hundreds of other teachers around the world by becoming a Top Music Pro member and get access to all our bonus content and flagship courses. And don't forget to follow topmusic.co on social media and subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen to it. That's all for today. We'll see you in the studio.